let's shift gears for a minute. We've heard a little bit from St. David's. We've heard a little bit from the Double Handing Gang. Let's go over to Gibbs Hill. Uh, Tenacious, the winner of the Gibbs Hill Lighthouse Division. Thank you all. You're very kind. Um, start out by saying that um, the boat we sailed down on, uh, we did it for fun with people that we would have enjoyed to te tenacious. We did it for fun with people that we thought would um, that would get along well on the boat and have enough experience uh, to do the job well. We did not, in any stretch of the imagination, think that we could win the Gibbs Hill Division. And the reason I tell this to you folks is um, when briefing the crew before we came down, I explained to them that this race is four parts. Uh, part number one is uh, getting to and setting up for the Gulf Stream. And uh, at that point, 30% of the boats have, uh, have run their race. It's over. They're, they probably don't have a chance of competing. Um, the next 30% falls by the wayside going through the stream and how they manage it. Um, so you end up with about 30% of the boats south of the stream that are still in contention for a podium finish. Um, in that next two or 300 miles south of the stream, a lot of boats get very euphoric and uh, stop putting the pedal down and are just darn glad to be sailing in blue water. That leaves about 10% of the boats who are still in competition for a podium finish. That 10% is decided within 100 miles of the island and the, and the approach that they take. And um, so I informed the crew that at each one of these junctures they were going to be reminded that they were still racing to Bermuda and that they were still in contention. And um, <laughs> we were lying to them, but, or thought we were. Uh, <laughs> But generals do that to their to their <laughs> to their troops. So, uh, uh, yeah, very much so. It's um, I've always thought yacht racing is more about sports psychology than it is about, uh, or as equally as important as it is about boat preparation and talent. Um, if you think Rich DeMullen is going to beat you on the race course, Rich DeMullen will beat you every time. You'll allow him to do it. If you decide that you, you know that's just not going to happen, or you're going to do everything to stop that from happening, then you stand a chance. Um, now, as for navigating for the race, um, and the way we manage the race, and the, and the reason I say manage the race instead of navigating it, is because that's all you can do. You you lay out a plan, and um, and you put in your waypoints, and you. I'm a, I'm a paper navigator, by the way. I, I electronics are really fun to play with. Um, I don't think I could ever have the expertise to master them, although I apply myself strongly to them. But at the end of the day, I like doing everything on paper. It's old school, but it's the only school I know. And um, so pre-race, we mapped out where we thought the eddies would be, how much they had drifted, uh, the warms drifting a little more, uh, how much they had drifted, and where we ideally would like to go. So we set a waypoint uh, for the new position of warm eddy. Um, to enter it about 30, si 30 miles inside of its outer edge, and um, we probably missed that by about 25 miles. And uh, as we were, we were, and we were not willing to tack to go into the eddy. I wasn't going to put the distances towards Maryland to head towards the Bermuda. Um, we still saw our maybe a knot and a half at times uh, kicking us down to the stream. We fell out of that eddy on a header in light, in very light air, um, and. We're paralleling the north wall, missed our entry point by some 30 miles. Um, my philosophy is that these are signposts along the way. When you get to that signpost, if you can't go up to it without just banging your head against the wall, there's no point. It's time for a new plan. So a plan is everything. Sticking to it means absolutely nothing. Um, so we picked our new entry point, and then another new one, and then another new one. And <laughs> And then another one. And that went on for uh, eight or nine hours. <laughs> and finally, we got down to where the north wall was starting to turn back north again. And I said, OK, um, I was hoping for that big lift. And we've been paralleling the north edge of the stream for, um, you know, for the better part of eight, nine hours. And staying you know, 25 miles off of it and never realizing glory of getting into it. So we bit the bull. And we had, we had about a knot and a quarter of current pushing us you know, about 40 degrees off rum line or from where we were to the island. Um, so we bit the boat, tacked for the island, or tacked to go into the stream. And, um, and as we went in, um, 
we watched the times uh, as we entered. We watched the temperature come up. Watched our VMG crap out uh, to a waypoint off of uh, northeast. Um, that was telling us that we were making 2.4 knots uh, VMG towards towards the mark. Um, this was a very sad moment on the boat. Um, <laughs> who is this nut who's sitting down at the chart table, and why is he taking us here? And uh, so we stood on. And um, we watched a couple boats get in and flip and cross our transom, looking very good, probably making an SOG of nine and a half or better knots. And we were struggling at about the same SOG that Rich was realizing, about five knots across the stream, um, with our VMG rising, and, but never getting any better than 4.8, until we were about two-thirds of the way across. We started realizing knocks from about the halfway point on uh, in the stream, got across the axis realized some knocks, uh, tried one tack, and uh, we're going very fast towards Portugal, but again, not having any euros with us, we decided it was time to go back, and, uh, and we did so, and so we took one half hour hitch towards Portugal, and one half hour hitch back towards Delmarva, and then uh, the wind fared a little more for the other tack, so we, we flipped back, and under a line of thunder squalls of the biggest clouds I think I've ever seen in the stream, uh, biggest squarest clouds, uh, we tacked to weather of them, uh, realized their lift that brought us uh, 10 degrees above our course to the to Bermuda, and um, and we're very happy go lucky from that point on making a great VMG. Um, that scenario allowed us to then work our way to first eddy out stream. Um, we were doing so the um, quite well. Um, the navig the uh, watch captain on board. I, at that point, I was exhausted and went to sleep, obviously, because, well, that's what navigators do after the Gulf Stream. And um, he felt the temperature was rising going into the eddy, and, uh, and he was seeing a, a knot and a half of negative current and, and crack sheets more, hoping that he would find something favorable. Um, about 20 minutes after that change, I came up on deck and I said, you know, I hate warm eddies. I hate all eddies, really. but." Um, we took a hitch for about 45 minutes to see if we could get the temperature to stabilize. Uh, we couldn't, and my clarity had come back some, so we flipped back towards Bermuda, and in about two hours, uh, we got from one hemisphere of that eddy to the other and realized uh, about uh, a knot and three quarters to two, two and a half knots of boost straight at the island. Uh, we rode that for what seemed a lifetime, and uh, once breaking out of that, we started seeking the, the cold eddy further down the line. Um, it was close enough to rum that to our heading to the mark that uh, we still wanted to try to take advantage of it. And as Richard noted, being a small boat, you got to take every advantage you can get to. Um, we got into that eddy, uh, and again, was real, we're realizing more than a knot and a quarter, knot and a half a current, and that must have lasted the better part of nine or ten hours um, and kicked us right along. Um, I kept chuckling to myself, saying, "It looks like we never fell out of the Gulf Stream because we're." getting this push, 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 push. Um, at that point, we, we, were, we were still trying to stay well west of rum line. We were cracking sheets with building breeze. Uh, we were sailing with a, a number three and two reefs, and as many people on the rail who could tolerate it and didn't, weren't dying from lack of uh, from sleep deprivation. And um, we came down and did not get ourselves east of the traditional rum, li rum line until northeast breakers. And at that point, we uh, switched to a number one and hardened up towards the, towards the finish. And um, so, you know, we, we had a plan. We abandoned philosophically. We stuck to the plan pretty closely. Uh, pragmatically, we abandoned parts of the plan that became unrealistic. Um, but everything we thought we were setting out to accomplish within the realm of reality, we accomplished. And, uh, you know, finishing at 9.30 on, uh, on Tuesday night, um, with a lot of big boats, we thought we were, had done pretty well. Um, started to watch Captain Steve King called his daughter to tell her that we had finished. She's a 12-year-old girl. And uh, they told us that we had made up a lot of ground south of Gulf Stream up on the rest of the fleet. And, um, and she said, Daddy, I, um, you know, I'm reading the elapsed times here, and you may have won. And, he's, and he repeats this to me and says, don't tell the rest of the crew, but my daughter thinks we've won. And he goes, but, but she's 12, you know? <laughs> and, and so I quit back to him. I, I said, well, God bless 12-year-olds as I have one myself. And, um, and I said, well, you know, from, from her lips to God's ears, and, you know, maybe, she, maybe she's got the mathematics skills. 